The criminal justice system in America is broken. We spend over $60 billion on prisons and jails. The average person breaks three laws a day without even realizing it. Almost three million children have a parent behind bars. But as terrible as this is, we can fix it. By bringing together leaders from all parts of society, community activists, academics, policymakers, we can make a difference. The Charles Koch Institute is already leading on criminal justice reform through our educational programs, grants, and nonpartisan public events. We're committed to expanding our efforts. Over the next several years, we'll be identifying researchers and organizations that can take us to the next level. We can't do it alone. We need your help. That's why we've invited you here to New Orleans for the next three days of discussion, collaboration, and networking. And when you leave, we hope you take the best new ideas home with you. Welcome to Advancing Justice, an agenda for human dignity and public safety. Great crowd. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Brian Hooks. I'm president of the Charles Koch Foundation and the Charles Koch Institute. And we are thrilled to have so many of you here. And it's my great pleasure to uh, kick us off uh, for our summit, Advancing Justice, an Agenda for Human Dignity and Public Safety. Now, this is a big crowd. And we really appreciate you all being here and being willing to roll up your sleeves and work with us in the days ahead. As the title of our event implies, we have an ambitious couple of days planned for us. What we hope to walk away after, what we hope to walk away with after the next couple of days of discussion is much greater clarity on what needs to be done going forward as we all continue our work to help improve this country's criminal justice system. So we have about 550 people registered for this event. And so <laughs> And though I'm having trouble seeing, I believe uh, if it's not already, it will be standing room only. And so we appreciate your indulgence as we've tried to accommodate so many people who uh, are willing to come and really have a productive conversation. And nobody is here by accident, right? This was an invitation only event, which means that every single person that will be here this week, th the next couple of days, don't worry, it's just a couple of days. <laughs> every single one of you has a role to play in helping to move uh, this, this issue forward to make progress on this issue. And in fact, many of you are already doing so. So you're people of action, and make no mistake about it, we didn't come here just to talk, right? These next couple of days are about action. We're counting on people in this group to help us identify the barriers to progress and the gaps in knowledge that need to be filled in order to continue to move the ball forward on this critical issue. Move the ball forward on reform, and help to continue to remove barriers to opportunity that stand in the way of so many people living fulfilling and meaningful lives. Barriers that tend to disproportionately affect the least fortunate in our society. So you all know this uh, as well as anyone. This is an issue that separates families. It's an issue that divides communities. And ultimately, it's an issue that strikes at the heart of how our society treats people, often in their darkest hours. So this is an issue addressing barriers to opportunity, especially for the least fortunate, barriers like those that exist within our criminal justice system that the Charles Koch Foundation has been dedicated to addressing for a long, long time. But we're not alone, right? Many of you uh, here today have been committed for a long, long time as well. And so we're honored and we're thrilled to be joined by all of you, to be joined from representatives of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Open Society Foundation, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, the Democracy Fund, and the Rockefeller Foundation, along with so many of you who have made your commitment to addressing this issue, whether it's judges, whether it's activists, 
where there's members, members of the media, members of community groups, or just concerned citizens. So we have a phenomenal group. I think you'll agree. We've built in some time over the course of the next couple of days for you to get to know one another, to have meaningful conversations. And so we really appreciate all of you taking your time to join us for this important conversation. I'd like to invite my colleague, Vakrant Reddy, to come up. Vakrant will tell you more about why we're here and what we hope to accomplish over the next couple of days. Uh, and so I'll just say thank you again. Let's continue to think big as we all work to address uh, some of the most challenging issues with this important uh, topic, a topic that affects so many of our families, our communities, and ultimately our country. So thank you very much for being here. Vakrant? Hello. Gosh, this is so incredibly exciting. It's personally exciting for me because there are so many friends in the room tonight, actually. There are friends, there are people who have been mentors uh, to me for a long time, people I really admire. And in fact, I should say that I, I tried to put a lot of thought into my opening remarks. Like, What am I going to say to kick this off? I really want to impress all these people who have been so important to me and who are so significant in this space. So I had what I thought was a very brilliant idea. I thought. There are a lot of great novels and stories that take place in Louisiana. And maybe I could find a wonderful line that would encapsulate what we're trying to do over the next three days. And I went to my parents' house. My, my uh, old books from high school are still on a shelf. And I pulled down these old Walker Percy novels. I pulled down uh, A Streetcar Named Desire, dog-eared copy, John Kennedy Tool. It's all marked up. I tried to find just the perfect line. So I'm looking through all these books, and the TV's on in the background. And Duck Dynasty is on. <laughs> the Coke PR team is really worried about what I'm about to say. <laughs> now, so somebody on the show just says something like, well, sometimes you think stuff's not connected, but it is. And I thought, you know, that'll do. <laughs> that works for me. Sometimes it doesn't seem like stuff is connected, but it is. There are people here who work on overcriminalization. There are people here who work on the militarization of American policing. There are people here who work on civil asset forfeiture. There are people here who work on the question of alternatives to incarceration. There are those here who work on collateral consequences when you emerge from incarceration, what you still have to deal with. All of these things are very disparate parts of the American criminal justice system. And in some ways, some of them may not seem connected, but they are. They are all very connected. And I hope that because we have so many wonderful people who work on these issues gathered here in New Orleans this week, that you all meet each other, you'll talk, you'll find these connections, and um, that it will be a very fruitful week for everyone. I should say when I mentioned we have all of these organizations, we, I think we literally have, as Brian said, some, something like 500 people from about 300 different organizations, as a matter of fact. And what I'd like to do now is um, is have all of you, uh, you know, kind of ask yourself, what is the objective of doing a summit like this? Because, you know, you go to summits and conferences all the time, and you always want to make sure there's some kind of an objective. The objective, I think, uh, is to meet as many people as you can from all 300 of these organizations. You should learn about the incredible work that they do, learn about the different ways that you can collaborate with them, learn about ways that the Charles Koch Institute can collaborate with all of you, and, uh, and I think that, that's really uh, the primary objective of this week. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to, uh, is what we are going to do now, is I'm going to introduce three representatives to come up and speak a little bit about the kinds of work that they do. And they represent different spaces. Uh, we've got somebody here from a university. We've got somebody from a scholarship fund. We've got somebody here from a public policy think tank. And they're all going to talk a little bit about the really exciting and incredible work that they do. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Howard Wall, who comes to us from Lindenwood University. And as a matter of fact, on Monday, Howard actually hosted a criminal justice reform event at Lindenwood, which is not too far from Ferguson, Missouri, as a matter of fact. Uh, several of the people in the audience actually were there on Monday night. And we put together just a very short video about what happened on Monday. We're going to watch the video and then meet Dr. Howard Wall. We recognize that the issues in Ferguson and in St. Louis County and in our community are not just here. They're everywhere. 
perspective until we begin to look at problems from, if not the same perspective, understand the other side's perspective, I don't think we'd have a dialogue. It's so important to have this panel of people, all from diverse political and cultural backgrounds. Left, right, center, Democrat, Republican, urban, rural, black, white, whatever. This is an opportunity to work on things that do unite the political spectrum. This is about keeping human beings safe. That's a big part of why you have to do criminal justice reform. Our endeavor to reform the criminal justice system is only beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Howard Wall. Well, thank you very much. Um, and we did have a great time, and Rick Rant was, was was passable on Monday, so I agreed to, to come here. Uh, now, uh, my charge today was to kind of tell fellow academics that they actually have a role to play in, in what's going on in criminal justice reform, even if they don't realize it from off the bat. So to kind of get you where I got to, because I'm a research economist, used to be an economist at the Federal Reserve, and criminal justice reform was not at all on my, my radar. But through my institute, the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise at Lindenwood, we somehow became uh, heavily involved for a kind of a confluence of events. So let me kind of go through our story, and any of you fellow academics out there, maybe some of this will, uh, will, will help you out in realizing that maybe this is an issue you can get involved in too. So we started our institute, uh, the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise, about two and a half years ago, and uh, it was founded with a generous gift from a member of the board of directors at Lindenwood, John Hammond, and John's vision was for a, an educational institute to promote liberty, uh, free markets, and, uh, and general freedom. Right? So uh, from the outset, it was about economics, but we did want to do something a little bit more broadly. So my colleagues that we added to, uh, to the institute were a rather um, colorful group, and I know Vikrant has met my colleague Rachel. So we, she is a, uh, Rachel Duchant is an absolute force of nature who was really responsible for the event on Monday, and she is a libertarian philosopher. And then our third member of our, our group is David Rosenwasser, who is a self-described huckster and a former marketing director for the Ring Ring Brothers Circus. So he runs our entrepreneurship center. Uh, so we said, well, we'll see what we can do. We'll get together and see how this goes. Well, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of resources, and it was just the three of us, but we went and we did a lot of great events, I thought, and uh, one thing that was consistent with what we did was to try to bring together, you know, disparate uh, people, people from different perspectives, and maybe some who agree on, one, on this, some issue from the left and the right. So uh, one good example of that is last spring we had Ralph Nader and Grover Norquist together on the stage talking about corny capitalism. I don't know if Grover is here. I know he's supposed to be here at some point during the conference, but if you're here, good to see you again. <laughs> now, given what we were doing, you know, we were just kind of floating along wondering where this was all going to go. And then about a year ago, you might remember that in Ferguson, Missouri, which is a, a smallish city in North St. Louis County, not too far from us, uh, there were incidents, right? So the things that really hit us were that there were, you know, various riots and a lot of destruction to local businesses. Now, some of you are probably not aware that Ferguson was one of the last places in St. Louis County that you would expect any of this thing to happen because Ferguson has gotten a bad name for itself, but it was really kind of an island of calm and prosperity in North St. Louis County where there were many other cities that have much bigger problems. So it was a little bit odd that it happened in Ferguson, and perhaps it was providential that it did because they had the, uh, the ability to, you know, to recover and to maybe do something about their, their problems. Uh, but at any rate, you know, we wondered what role we would be able to play in helping our neighbors in Ferguson, which by the way is actually about 15 miles away from us. We were out in St. Charles, which we consider ourselves a whole different, different city. Um, but you know, we were kind of at a loss. But what we came up with was we had a, a hashtag uh, that we said to try to get people to go to Ferguson to the businesses because it was actually quite a safe place to go once, once they put the fires out. Uh, but also we had a kind of a modest entrepreneurship initiative where we were gonna train small, small business people in the Ferguson area 
how to maybe improve their business and kind of get the entrepreneurial spirit going in, in the community. So we went to the city of Ferguson uh, to just kind of get some help in marketing our efforts. And when we met with the representatives, we were, we were just met with a cascade of, of requests. They said, can you do this for us? Can you do that for us? And, it's, and these were things we didn't even imagine would, we could do or that were even needed. So within a couple of weeks, uh, we had put together a, my institute had put together a partnership between the Lindenwood and the city of Ferguson where we would provide assistance from our students, our students would get course credit, and very quickly the sorts of things that we ended up doing were, uh, if I can run these down a bit, we had uh, student interns in city agencies, student produced PSAs, a film by a faculty documentarian, uh, expanded our entrepreneurship training, we now have student led teams that go in and help small businesses with their, their marketing and accounting and so on. And we have a listening circles where police officers go and engage with middle school students and high school students. Uh, we have uh, bigger efforts in recruiting African American students to attend our, our university and become criminal justice majors and have more African American representation on local police forces. And to top it off, our university president ponied up for nearly a million dollars in academic scholarships to uh, use in North St. Louis County. Now, just as, as an aside, just to give a sh shout out to my university, uh, as I said, Lindenwood is not actually that close to Ferguson. We're over the Missouri River and down the road quite a bit. Um, but there's a large state university that is a stone's throw from Ferguson. It was maybe a mile or two the, is where the campus is from the center of all of the disturbances. That's the University of Missouri at St. Louis. And when the city leaders of Ferguson contacted their neighbors at the state university, their phone calls weren't even weren't answered. They just it was crickets were chirping from their neighboring university and also from some of the other universities that were closer by. And here we were just kind of showing up and they were just bursting with all sorts of things we could do. And, and to credit to my university, we just jumped in uh, with, you know, both feet. You know, so a major contributor to the Ferguson, uh, the events in Ferguson, was the erosion of trust between the community and the local police forces. And again, it's not just Ferguson, this is a, just a short, shorthand for North St. Louis County. Right? So specifically, taxation by ci citation meant that thousands or tens of thousands of low income and African American residents had been caught in a spiral of legal abuse through which many of the small cities in the region were collecting in excess of 30% of their revenue. And some of the cities were collecting 60, 70% of the revenue through tickets and associated fines for failure to appear and so on. So the state of Missouri, the legislature actually responded very quickly and has uh, passed a major reform to uh, municipal court systems and police and set limits on how much of this activity can, can go on. So kind of hopeful for the future there. Now, given that there was broad, broad support in Missouri for this municipal court reform, we saw an opportunity to broaden the discussion to include more generally criminal justice reform. And again, I'm not sure how I ended up doing all this. I really like sitting, staring at my computer, running regressions. Uh, but here I was uh, doing this. And it, it turns out I'll be back to running my regressions. I'll get to that. And you know, it just so happened we had already begun discussions with the Koch Foundation for a partnership on doing a variety of things. So we had a confluence of, of events, and the next thing you knew, we, we had our, our summit on Monday looking at criminal justice reform in Missouri, and Ferguson was a, one of the uh, major topics, and it was really a, a terrific uh, event. So in the, the future, what we're going to do to follow up on this is you know, we're certainly going to be keeping up with our contacts that we made and making sure the conversation keeps going and bringing in our unlikely partners to talk to one another and maybe get, get things done. Uh, but also, we're moving to, toward having a research center, a regional research center for, in our criminal justice department doing re empirical research on what works best. It turns out that the Missouri Department of Corrections and also our, our federal district court is very interested in, in solid research on what works? So that's where I come in. I'm back to running my regressions. The criminal justice people have all this data. I have the software and the econometric skills, so I'm back. I'll be back behind my desk 
as soon as I fly back to St. Louis. Now, in closing, to my advice to the academics here, uh, you know, many of you are probably unaware, as I was, of the role that you can play in fostering conversations and research on issues such as criminal justice reform that might be kind of outside of your normal purview. Or, like me, you know, you're not really, you fail to see how economic growth and opportunity, the things you're, that I was focused on, are intertwined with criminal, the criminal justice system. So we at Lindenwood were actually probably more engaged in the community than, uh, than a lot of universities, but we completely, completely miss this. And we keep thinking, you know, how, how weren't we involved in this earlier, earlier on? So, you know, it doesn't really take a crisis like what happened in Ferguson to, uh, you know, to get things going. You shouldn't wait for that. Uh, in fact, there are many crises or constant crises going on in your communities all the time. All right, so they'll be more than happy to uh, listen to you and to help you out and just have a conversation. So my suggestion is to just go out in your community, just talk to uh, business people in these communities, talk to some city leaders, and talk to your other faculty and your students, and you never know where it will, where it will go. You might end up in, in New Orleans having a, having a talk to non-economists of all things. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Howard. It's so important to invest in our colleges and our universities. But of course, you also have to invest in the students themselves. And to talk a little bit about that, we've invited Mr. Johnny Taylor from the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, as he asked me to say, here's Johnny. <laughs> Man, it's bright up here. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for having us here. My colleagues, Jennifer Wider, who heads our strategy and innovation work, and Christopher Lopez, one of our policy specialists, have joined me on this trip here. I represent the country's 47 public historically black colleges and universities. We refer to them as HBCUs. Hey. There are, I'm pleased to say, and I hope I have them all right, but I think there are four of our member schools in the room. I'll quickly tell you what we do, but Grambling State University, Southern State University, uh, Florida A&M University, I know I better not miss that one, and I know I'm gonna miss one, but don't let me do it, is Jackson State University from Mississippi. Our students and our faculty are here, uh, but we represent 47 of these institutions. There are 300,000 students on our campuses, 23 states, the District of Columbia, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, we are 80% of all historically black college and university students represented by the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. I wasn't planning to be here. I actually am in five cities this week. When I received the call, literally, it's, I'm overwhelmed. Like, I'm not sure where I am right now, except I'll tell you a long story later, Jennifer. I just saved you on that one. But inside story. Um, but what made me want to come here when I realized that this, what this convening was about was because this has become a personal issue for us at the Thurgood Marshall College. And I have this saying that is grammatically perhaps not incorrect. No, in fact, it's not correct. But only us can save us is what I tell our community. Okay, only us can save us. And so the students on our campuses, the faculty on our campuses, I said, these are real issues. We knew about a Ferguson before there was a Ferguson. See, the folks in this room thought the problems that beset Ferguson were new. No, my friends, these lasted, they were around for a very long time, and our community knew it. We have an obligation as historically black colleges and universities to work with each of you, to work with universities like Lindenwood University, to work with the Charles Koch Foundation, to work with Ford and, and who are, uh, the number of you who are in this room, open society. Our goal is to help prevent these problems. You understand? What challenges me and what constructs, what uh, concerns me as a lawyer is when I hear uh, so many people go out and research the black community without talking to the black community. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Clap. <laughs> and that's a real challenge for us. So while we have a lot of well-intended people doing really good research, basic research, when it's applied, the results sometimes surprise them. And we're sitting there saying, well, it didn't surprise us. 
So guess what? That's the opportunity. This is not about blaming anyone. It's about looking and reflecting on the HBCU community and thinking about this as an opportunity. So I come to you today to represent that we are serious about criminal justice reform. And it's not going to be a simple answer. I'm going to end by telling you a story that I had the other day. I was at an event, and the guy stood up and he said, listen, we are going to reduce mass incarceration. We're going to reduce the number of people who've been incarcerated by half by 2025. And I'm sitting at the table, and I said, well, hell, I could do that tomorrow. Just release half of them. <laughs> I mean, seriously? It's a little bit more complicated than that, because my friends, you can't have a conversation about reducing incarcerated, the incarceration rates if you don't reduce crime. We have to have both conversations. They are inextricably <laughs> intertwined. And it's a complicated issue, complicated by all sorts of cultural norms and mores and all of that good stuff. But at the end of the day, I come to you on my way to Philly and New York tomorrow and wherever else I'm supposed to be for the rest of the week to say that the historically black college and university community is committed to solving this problem. Thank you very much, Koch Foundation, and thank you all of you in the room for giving us this time. It's so important to invest in students because students, of course, are going to be wrestling with these criminal justice challenges in the future that you and I cannot even begin to imagine. But we've also got criminal justice challenges in the present. And a lot of times, to address those challenges, you have to turn to the public policy community and the think tanks. And I'm very excited to say that tonight, to speak on behalf of the think tank world, we have got a representative from what is, for my money, the finest think tank in the United States, Ladies and gentlemen, Brooke Rollins of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He had to say that because I hired him six years ago and got him launched into the criminal justice policy reform world. So uh, thank you, Vikrant. That was lovely. I am so grateful to be here today. And I was telling Brian backstage, this is full circle for me and for members of our team who are in the audience tonight. I um, have been a part of this idea and this movement uh, since almost the beginning of my time with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which was about 13 and a half years ago. And right around then, I maybe had been working there. We had three employees at the time. We now have more than 50. So we've seen a lot of growth through the last number of years. But towards the beginning of my time, we decided uh, had a phone call from a board member who said, Brooke, conservatives have it all wrong on criminal justice. And at the time, we're a very small group. And I said, well, we're working on education opportunity, and we're working on tort reform and some tax work. And it never occurred to me to work on criminal justice. And he said, if you think about it, all our side talks about is building more prisons and throwing people in those prisons. And there's no discussion of the cost to community and the cost to family and the cost to the taxpayer and whether we're actually making any progress on decreasing crime. And, and I said, well, that's fascinating. Tell me more. And he said, well, I think that we have such an opportunity in the big state of Texas. We're getting tough on crime. It doesn't get much tougher to completely change the narrative and in doing so, change the world. And a few months later, actually maybe in less than that, Mark Levin, uh, I thought of a young lawyer who had just finished law school, thinking who could come on board to help us with this, and hired one Mark Levin. You'll hear him speak over the next few days, and he's been a big part of this effort for many, many years now. And he started working immediately with another great hero in this movement, one Jerry Madden, who is also here today who at the time was a conservative Republican in the Texas House of Representatives at, and chairing, more importantly, the House Corrections Committee, who began to work with the very liberal Democrat senator who was chair of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee. And we decided that this issue wasn't Republican or Democrat or liberal or conservative or left or right. This was a human issue and that we had to get in front of it. And Thank you. And I am so proud to say that 10 plus years into this world and into this issue and moving in front of it, 
that the state of Texas has closed three prisons. We've stopped two more from being built. This is at a time where our population has exploded. We've shut down, I believe, seven, maybe eight juvenile facilities. And the incredible thing, what my friend just started to say, or was just talking about, crime rate is down 27% in our state. So the opportunity to change the world, to help communities, to keep families together, to change everything that is wrong about our civil society, I believe starts with meetings like this, with those of us from different philosophical worlds coming together to figure out how to fix it. Mother Teresa actually said, do never depend on your leaders. It all changes when we work person to person to person. And so for the next two days here in beautiful Louisiana, New Orleans, one of my favorite cities, I challenge you all to work person to person to person as we begin to explore how to continue this incredible movement that I believe began because of a great idea and some really hard work and some vision and some courage by many of the people in this room tonight the Charles Koch Foundation, the Charles Koch Institute has partnered with us on this from almost the very beginning. And so to be here tonight in front of all of you is such a gift and such a blessing to see how this entire movement has exploded. And now we will begin to change the world state by state, country by country to put together what has been broken. Victor Hugo said there is nothing more powerful in the world than an idea whose time has come. My friends, the time has come. I wish you luck, and let's go change the world together. Thank you so much. See, that's why Brooke was my boss, because she quotes Victor Hugo and Mother Teresa, and I quote Duck Dynasty. It was really great to hear from Howard and from Johnny and from Brooke tonight. It was really wonderful, but again, that's just really scratching the surface. As I said, we have about 300 different organizations here, and I want to take just a quick moment to point out something in particular. Momentarily, I'm going to uh, ask all of you to join me in the Astor Gallery for a reception, and there are a lot of tables there from nonprofits that we've invited from or all over the country. Small nonprofits, you may not have heard of them, but they do fantastic work, and please, Go say hello to them, take a look at uh, what's on the tables, and read about and talk to them about all the extraordinary things that they're doing to advance this issue. But that really is it. Now I just need to tell you guys that we're going to start bright and early tomorrow morning at 8.30. Please join me and the rest of the CKI team out in the Astor Gallery for a reception. And uh, I look forward to meeting everybody in the room this week. <laughs>